Good evening, everyone. I know we're waiting for a few more people to kind of trickle in, but I'm gonna go ahead and get us started so we can get on with our presentation tonight. My name is Amanda McFillin. I'm the manager of programs here at the Historic New Orleans Collection. And we're so excited to have all of y'all here with us tonight for our program this evening, Jean Lafitte Reveal. In a moment, I'm gonna introduce our speakers so they can get underway with their presentations, but just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. So, um, we are going to, the way the program is going to work, I'm going to introduce our speakers, they are going to present, and then afterwards we're going to have a Q&A. If you have questions for our panelists, um, if you just go down, if you kind of wave your cursor over the screen, you'll see that tool that toolbar down at the bottom of your screen, and you see that Q&A button. Put your questions, just click on that and push your questions there to submit them to us. At the end of the program, when we are opening our Q&A, that's where I'm going to be looking to ask our questions from. Uh, we also have a chat button down there you'll see at the bottom of the screen. Click on that and join the chat. Um, I love it when people are chatting. Let us know where you're tuning in from. It's so fun to see where people are tuning in from all over the country. Um, you can talk to each other there while the program is going on. So please jump in the chat, say hi to everyone. Don't be shy. Um, you know, a few more things. If you want to keep up with our um, events, we'll post a link so you can join our newsletter. You can also follow us on social media to keep up with what's coming up uh in the next few few months uh we would love to see you there um and also i just want to say thank you to all of our members in the hnc community your support really is so important to us and helps us to be able to do events like you're seeing tonight so thank you very much aha i already see somebody is tuning in from new orleans hello keely nice to have you here tonight um so anyhow without further ado i'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers tonight so tonight we have joining us Dr. Ashley Oliphant and Beth Yarbrough. They are a mother-daughter research team from Lincolnton, North Carolina. Dr. Oliphant is an associate professor of English at Pfeiffer University, where she has taught in the English department since 2007. She is an active member of the Hemingway Society, having presented at its international conferences and published in the Hemingway Review. Beth Yarbrough is a nationally known artist and photographer whose depictions of historic homes and structures across the South are featured on her website, Southern Voices, and in her extensive collection of published calendars. So Ashley and Beth, we are so excited to have y'all here tonight. And I'm just waiting for them. Here we go. Here we go, hi. Ashley and Beth, hi. How are y'all doing? We are doing great. Hi. Oh, we're so excited. Um, I'm so excited to hear your talk. I've actually already heard it once before. I'm excited <laughs> to hear it again <laughs> and to hear about maybe some new insights you have to share with us. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to y'all and I'll okay. see y'all back at the end for the Q&A. All right. All right. Great. And so you are you going to share our, our PowerPoint and we can just say move the slide? Is that correct? Exactly. Yep. All right. You can go right ahead now. and share in advance to the next slide if you like. Thank you. So we are uh, very excited to be here today. Uh, I am Ashley. This is my mom, Beth. Hello. Um, and we are um, just a couple of regular girls from North Carolina. Uh, but uh, we did something sort of not regular uh, earlier this year and actually over the last two years. To put it mildly. Yeah. We ended up um, figuring out what really happened to Jean Lafitte. And we can't say that we really set out to do that. Um, but uh, that's what we ended up doing, and we're uh, very excited to uh, to share our findings with you and to talk about um, some of our uh, latest research um, that is ongoing for the sequel to the book. Um, you can move to the next slide. This is the cover, um, uh, the University of Louisiana at Lafayette Press. Um, published our book, Jean Lafitte mm -hmm. Revealed, Unraveling One of America's Longest Running Mysteries in um, March of this year. And since then, we have been on uh, a national book tour. Um, in my introduction, I was announced as, a, um, as a, an associate professor of English at Pfeiffer. I have since retired um, from teaching. Uh, and uh, got that full professorship before I before I departed. But um, the um, the national uh, attention that this project has gained really made it um, clear that I wasn't yeah. going to be able to travel with my mom and, and promote this book and speak to all of the groups that 
wanted to hear what we found uh, mm-hmm. while I was still teaching. And so um, I have retired. We're on the full time speaker circuit now. Uh, and so if you're a part of another group um, that might be interested in hosting mm-hmm. us for either an in-person or a virtual event, um, please do look us up. We'd be um, glad to, uh, to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but next slide, let's um, go ahead and jump right in. The green star on the PowerPoint there is Lincolnton, North Carolina. Both of us born and raised there. Mm-hmm. We're just a little bit west of Charlotte. And um, we have always heard stories Uh, in our hometown about this really strange man named Lorenzo Ferrer, who arrived in Lincolnton in the year 1839. And even in those years, uh, and he lived there until his death in 1875, died at the age of 96. Even during those years, the people in Lincolnton said, something's not right about this fellow. The stories he's telling us about who he is and where he came from don't add up. He has all of this money, but he doesn't work. And uh, we're seeing uh, characteristics in him um, that make us believe that he is not who he says he is. And there were even whispers in his day that he may have been Jean Lafitte. There were already people there uh, putting those pieces together. And um, I had made the decision, you can move to the next slide. I had made the decision um, Uh, for my next book uh, to be a new biography of Jean Lafitte. Um, Nobody had written anything um, very innovative or um, new about him in long about 80 years. And I've always been fascinated with pirates. Um, And um, I'd written a book about sharks, a book about Jimmy Buffett, a book about Ernest Hemingway. uh, And I knew sort of next in line, I wanted from a woman's perspective, Mm -hmm. to write a new biography of Lafitte. Um, And my mom and I were in New Orleans having a great lunch at Antoine's, as I recall. And she said, I was in town to research. And she said, you know, Ashley, um, we have these legends in Lincolnton. It might be fun if you did a chapter of your book trying to figure out if Lorenzo Ferrer um, could be traced to, to maybe prove that he was not Lafitte, that he had origins elsewhere. And so we came home from that trip with bellies absolutely full of gumbo, ready to (laughs) to try to to figure it out. And it did not take us long. It was just a few weeks before we realized that we were finding things about this Ferrer fellow that um, nobody had found before. And we embarked on a two year research project. Um, It took us to seven or eight states. Mm -hmm. Um, We went as far west as Austin, Texas, as far north as Princeton, New Jersey. And we had made the decision that our book was not going to be based upon um, supposition or shaky newspaper articles or stories passed down from generations. We wanted artifacts and documents, primary documents to Um, hopefully prove our case. And after those two years of research, what we found absolutely stunned us. And so that's what we're going to talk to you about tonight. And so um, the the portrait that you see there um, that's actually housed at the Rosenberg Library in Galveston, the original, um, this may be what he looked like, but we kind of don't think so. Uh, There is no known portrait of Lafitte uh, that is uh, verified to have been produced from his likeness. But um, One of the great things about what we have done in our research is that we are not monkeying with the New Orleans timeline Mm -hmm. at all. We're not even uh, modifying the Galveston timeline. What we did was pick up those years in the Gulf when um, the the details about what happened to Lafitte got hazy. We picked up the story from there and... um, uh, were able to to sort of piece some things together that that uh, previous researchers had not discovered. Um, so you can move to the next slide. Um, we, um, uh, for those of you who need sort of a little bit of a refresher, we won't belabor the point. Um, Lafitte was in his day one of the most prolific uh, middlemen uh, that uh, and successful middlemen as far as a business operation that America has ever seen. Um, He set up his shop. Uh, We know he got to to New Orleans area in 1805. That's the first document that places him there. But in the swamps um, south of New Orleans around Barataria, 
he put together um, a group of about a thousand men uh, and about a hundred ships. And he and his men plundered the Gulf, uh, brought in what they had stolen and found market for it in New Orleans. And at sort of the peak of his success, he was one of the 10 wealthiest men in America. Most people don't recognize that. The warehouses that were down in the swamp housed uh, millions of dollars of merchandise um, and that was in early 1800s mm-hmm. currency. So his fortune was just fast. And his genius was really in being able to manage people and to uh, figure out the best pipeline for um, securing goods and then bringing them successfully market. to market. Mm-hmm. And um, it was the auctions that he held down in Barataria that um, uh, brought him his success. It was at a time when the importation of enslaved people um, was either, uh, depending on the year we're talking about, either prohibited completely or um, dampened uh, by port authorities. And so he was able to provide um, goods and unfortunately enslaved people um, for the plantation owners all up and down the Mississippi River. Um, And that's really how his fortune was um, built. Um, We know as well that he um, participated and and historians disagree on how extensively uh, in the Battle of New Orleans. Um, It was his flints and uh, the manpower that the Baratarians offered Jackson and um, uh, other local officials uh, who were were attempting to defend the city. Um, You cannot discount how important that um, assistance was. Um, But his star wasn't shining so brightly after Mm -hmm. um, the Battle of New Orleans um, that the people had sort of had enough of his um, uh, shenanigans. And our our book goes into real detail about all of that. But he moved to Galveston, Texas. And I'll let my mom talk to you a little bit about um, the Galveston setup and um, what uh, came afterward. Well, for years before they actually ended up landing and setting up in Galveston, they had sort of had their eye on um, a different location because as as smart as they were, I think they understood that there was going to have to be a plan B eventually. And sure enough, um, they received their full pardon from Jackson, but they never retrieved their fortune. And so they were eventually forced out of New Orleans, and here was Plan B, which was Galveston. It was just beyond the reach at that point of um, the United States authorities, and yet close enough that they felt like they could still get their goods to market. And so it was basically a plan that looked good on paper, and it did work all for a couple of years, but um, not much beyond that. And they eventually ended up being run out of Galveston as well. Um, And as Ashley mentioned earlier, um, what we have discovered and pieced together really does not change either the New Orleans or the Galveston timeline, but following their exit from Galveston, they sort of disappeared into the fog of history. And that is where the various death theories began to come forward. And there was more than one. Um, The one that's on your screen was one of the most famous. This was a newspaper article that came out um, detailing one of those death theories. When we set out to try and piece together what might have happened, um, one of the first things we looked at was to try and figure out how many different death theories there were, because depending on which historical expert you were, um, they could not even agree among themselves. So we had all these things spread out on the dining room table and we looked at those. And and then I looked at Ashley and I said, you know what, a man can only die one time. So that means that not all of these can be true. And if only one of these is true, then what's to say that it's not true either. So that sort of left the gate wide open for us to pursue all of the what ifs. And sure enough, um, we, as Ashley said earlier, did find um, quite a bit. So um, we knew that Ferrer, who um, was one of Lafitte's aliases, he, um, of course, most of you who know anything about Jean Lafitte know that during his known lifetime in the early 1800s, he used 
many aliases, but um, Ferrer was um, admittedly his longest running and most successful. That man showed up in 1839, and this fog of history that I just described to you um, began somewhere in the mid-1820s. I think the last death theory showed up maybe around 1826. So we knew that we were going to have to um, check, double check and triple check to make sure that we did not find the man Lorenzo Ferrer somewhere alive and well on the planet at the same time that Jean Lafitte was documented. Um, you know, there would have gone the theory down the drain. And um, luckily that did not happen. And we did check <laughs> thoroughly um, but what we had was a gap of roughly um, a decade and a half, maybe a little bit longer, that we needed to close because there were missing years. And um, oddly enough, the footnote in a biography was one of the gateways to closing that gap. And I will toss it back to you. You can flip to the next slide. So um, the footnote that tipped us off was in a book about the man you see on the left, Arsène Latour. Um, very famous if you're in, in New Orleans or um, really anywhere, you probably know who Arsène Latour mm -hmm. is. Um, really good friend of Jean Lafitte. In fact, uh, he and Latour um, took a little trip up the river together as uh, spies for um, uh, Spain mm -hmm. uh, to map those rivers and sort of see what was happening up in there. Uh, Edward Livingston, um, also a very famous figure, uh, was Jean Lafitte's lawyer um, who knew that pirates had lawyers, but ours did. And um, these two men uh, were integral to us being able to find the first big hit um, that uh, cracked, began to crack this case for us. And so um, the footnote that we read in a book that came out in 2017 by an, an author named um, Garrigo, who has unfortunately since passed away, included a letter that passed between, a uh, dimension of a letter, I should say, mm -hmm. that passed between Latour and Livingston um, that mentioned a man in code that uh, they were corresponding about. That man's last name, supposedly, or name, was Maison Rouge. And when my mom found the footnote and made the connection. Uh, she just about had a hissy fit because she, the, the as Garrigo was writing the footnote, he said, I have no idea who this Maison Rouge fella could be, but if any of you readers know, uh, you know, please be on the case. She knew immediately. When Lafitte was in Galveston, he built a very uh, famous, famously large house and painted it bright red. Red house in French is Maison Rouge. We recognized in the year that that letter was um, written. It was in 29. Mm -hmm. And so that was at least three years beyond the point when Jean Lafitte was supposed to be really dead if you um, ad ad adhered to the death theories uh, that we had mentioned earlier. The problem was that that letter, uh, and we, we've not seen the text of it, was in an archive in France that had since been closed to all, a private archive that had since been closed to all researchers. There was no way for us to get in. So we uh, were hoping, praying, that there might be another Maison Rouge letter somewhere else. And you can move to the next slide. We got word that Edward Livingston's papers were housed at uh, Princeton's library in New Jersey. Um, and so we got in the car one day and said, let's go to Princeton, uh, drove from North Carolina, um, got there and began digging through boxes. And um, we tend to get ourselves in trouble wherever we go. Um, we just naturally find mischief. Yeah. Uh, the Princeton University Library was no different. Um, it's a, uh, um, a very difficult place to get in and out because they obviously have, you know, uh, treasures beyond imagination in that library, um, but we'd kind of gotten ourselves tangled up a little bit, even trying to gain entrance. But once we did, um, we sat down with boxes and boxes of Edward Livingston's yeah. uh, notoriously bad handwriting and began to scan uh, to see what we could find. And my mom was on the other side of the, the research room, 
Um, and we were just, you know, moving as quickly as we could when you're a researcher, time is money. And um, I heard her gasp audibly, just, Ooh! and of course, everybody in the whole library stops. And I hear her begin to say, Maison Rouge, Maison Rouge, Maison Rouge, louder and louder and louder. And so I run over and look down and she found an additional Maison Rouge letter this is it on your screen, um, dated May 23rd, 1829, uh, between Livingston, who at the time was living in Washington, and Latour, who had relocated to Havana, Cuba. And the letter suggests that um, Maison Rouge is still here in Cuba with Latour being hidden, uh, and that they still need Livingston's help. Livingston working in the Jackson presidential administration at that point, uh, needs help getting um, some of his money recovered, which they had assisted in helping him to squirrel away and hide um, in another country. And so um, we uh, learned our lesson in Princeton that they frown upon people shouting and cheering uh, in their archive. And we came this close to being thrown out, but we didn't care because we found proof that in 1829, Jean Lafitte was alive in Havana, Cuba, being hidden by Arsène Latour, his good friend. Um, what that did was take us to 1829. Mm -hmm. We needed to get to 1839, one decade later, because that is when um, Lorenzo Ferrer showed up in Lincolnton. It didn't take us long to figure out that lost decade. You can move to the next slide. And I'll let you take over and talk a little bit about um, where we found him. We found him first in the state of Mississippi. Um, researchers here in North Carolina who had searched for decades and actually um, <clears throat> close to a century to try and figure out where Mr. Ferrer had come from had always come up empty handed. And when we discovered this name on the uh, tax rolls of Capaya County, Mississippi, this was the first record of the man named Lorenzo Ferrer that has been written anywhere mm -hmm. that we could find. We searched port documents, we searched um, tax rolls, any kind of um, record that public record that was available, we looked. Apparently, the man named Ferrer um, just appeared full-blown, age 54, poof, in Capaya <laughs> County, Mississippi in the year 1830, about six months after the Maison Rouge letter was written from Havana. Now, we will go ahead and tell you that what we do not have is that piece of paper that says, I, Jean Lafitte, hereby change my name <laughs> to Lorenzo Ferrer. And oh, by the way, I plan to sneak back into the country. Uh, I'm probably going to sneak in uh, through Bayou Lafouche and go up through Baton Rouge and land in Mississippi. We do not have that document. So full disclosure. However, you will discover that what we found out about Lorenzo Ferrer later on um, makes all of that sort of a moot point. Yeah. So hold that thought. We have him now in Mississippi, and we needed first to make sure that this Lorenzo Ferrer was the same one who later migrated to North Carolina. That proof came in the form of um, a contract between Ferrer and a man named George Brewer. And I believe that's the next, next screen, slide. Yeah. the next slide. There was a contract between Ferrer and Mr. Brewer that related to um, a young woman aged about 17 named Louisa. She was obviously in this contract a slave owned by Ferrer and he was loaning her to Brewer for the period of one year. The uh, significance of this document is that when Ferrer did arrive 10 years later in North Carolina, the girl Louisa was by his side and her age in North Carolina and on her gravestone, because this is where she died, comports exactly with her age on this document in Mississippi. Um, we ended up dedicating this book to Louisa Ferrer for a number of reasons, but when we found this document, both of us really and truly felt like 
this beautiful young woman sort of raised her hand from the grave across 200 years and fingered this man and said, yes, it is him. It's the same one. And while she had no voice during her lifetime, um, we wanted to make sure that we honored her um, in the writing of this book. We always want to acknowledge, too, whenever we're giving a presentation that um, uh, we have a, a culture, unfortunately, that glamorizes piracy. Um, uh, built upon by, you know, companies like Disney that produce movies like Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, it's it's hard not to love Johnny Depp as a pirate. Um, But the truth of the matter is that when you look at what piracy really was and when you look at who Lafitte really was, um, he was a traitor of enslaved human beings on a mass scale. And there is no doubt that thousands of, of, of people were sold into lives of absolute misery Uh, because of him uh, and his greed and the greed of the men around him. Uh, And so uh, we always want to acknowledge that in these presentations and make sure that um, nothing he did is um, is glorified. Mm -hmm. Um, The document, I mean, you can move to the next slide. This Louisa document was really that piece of paper that helped us connect Mm -hmm. um, the Lorenzo Ferrer in Lincolnton and Mississippi. But one thing we want to mention before we get there is that Lafitte got himself a little married while he was down in Mississippi too. Um, We were astonished. We had to go to the courthouse in Raymond, Mississippi. It's Um, full of spiders, by the way. (laughs) Absolutely full of spiders. Um, And um, we um, found a marriage license there uh, between Lorenzo Ferrer and a very young 17-year-old girl named Nancy Alford. The um, marriage document uh, indicates that Ferrer was uh, 54. And so they um, got married, but their, uh, their marriage did not last. Mm-hmm. Um, In fact, less than two years after they got married, um, she was married to someone else and having lots and lots of babies. And we are um, of the opinion that um, Ferrer was likely discovered as being Jean Lafitte and uh, ended up being probably invited by this young woman's father to leave town and never come back. Um, and so there was a marriage, no children were produced, and um, this is the document that proves it. You can move to the next slide. What Ferrer did was jump to the next um, county up. Um, this is the courthouse of um, Canton, Mississippi, um, and uh, Madison County, for those of you who are not familiar. He jumped up there after being run out of Capaya County. Um, and he resumed what he was doing down in um, uh, down in the Jackson area, and that um, which we did not talk about, which we need to. Right. The whole reason that he came to Mississippi, which puzzled us, um, why do you leave Havana to come to Mississippi um, in 1830? That answer is easy: the cotton boom um, was just getting ready yeah. to explode. Jean Lafitte, according to the letter that we had from uh, Princeton, needed money. And this was Mississippi, the very best place to make money in America at that time. He um, was a land speculator and unfortunately a slave trader. Um, That is what he um, came to this area to do. But we show you um, the picture of Canton, Mississippi, because Ferrer made a critical connection there Mm -hmm. that ended up influencing the rest of his life. Uh, He met a band of brothers, three of them, who had come to the area for the same reason that he had, um, uh, which was land speculating and making money. Um, But their last name was Henderson. Uh, And we know that they were together because they were in working in the same very small land office in the area. Um, And we have documents that prove all of their business dealings that were were happening there. One of those brothers, James Pinckney Henderson, went on to become the first governor of Texas. They were from a very influential family, um, a large family, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, And these three brothers had just come to this part of Mississippi in order to make money. And that's where they met Ferrer. It was in 1839 that Lorenzo Ferrer comes to Lincoln to North Carolina because those Henderson boys were from Lincolnton. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, I believe it's their um, house, Woodside um, Plantation in 
uh, Lincolnton, which is not very far from where we are right now. This was the family seat of the Henderson brothers. And the ones who remained in Lincolnton welcomed Lorenzo mm -hmm. Ferrer to town with open arms and remained a part of his life in Lincolnton. Yes. Absolutely. Until the very moment that he died, one of them was even the, the executor of his will. Um, and so or the writer of his will. Um, and so um, it is uh, in Lincolnton um, where the story for us really started uh, and where the most astonishing discoveries that we made uh, were found. And I'll let you you can move to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about it. While he had been in Mississippi, this man stayed completely under the radar. Um, you did not find him in newspaper accounts. No. He did not become politically active. He did not own property, even though he bought and sold land day in and day out, um, most of it under the table or illegally in some way, shape or form. But once he was safely ensconced in this town, and this is a picture of the Lincoln County Courthouse, the, the current courthouse, which stands today, um, once he was here and safely surrounded by a new posse whose last name was Henderson, um, the old Lafitte tendencies once again emerged. And really and truly specifically, even though Ashley is correct that there is no official portrait of Jean Lafitte known to exist, what we do have are eyewitness accounts mm -hmm. from across 40 or 50 years and seven or 800 miles apart. Both of those groups of people describe the very same man in stature, in looks. They all described a man who was very tall, very handsome, dark complexion, um, fascinating conversationalist, um, very clever and cunning and uh, charming, um, had a wonderful way with the ladies, and the list goes on. In fact, there is a very long list in the book that details all of the exact similarities that these disparate groups of people describe, all the way down to both men had a preference, and we found documentation mm -hmm. of this, for otter skin, beaver skin caps. So it's really hard to get much more specific than that. But here we are now, beginning in the year 1839, Lorenzo Ferrer arrives here with money. He lived here for the last 35 years of his life, died at the age of 96, and never worked a single day the whole time he was here. Um, he all of a sudden was joining churches, buying property, making toasts in the public square, becoming politically active, loaning money, um, you name it. His name was there in the public record in abundance. And one of the most um, fascinating things that we discovered that really ended up um, cracking the case definitively the and connecting the name Lorenzo Ferrer with the name Jean Lafitte happened um, under the roof of Lincoln Lodge 137. In the year 1852, Ferrer um, helped to form a Masonic Lodge here in Lincolnton. And I think I will toss it back to yeah. you and you can pick it up from there. And I'll narrate a couple of slides here. The one you're looking at is Lincolnton's current courthouse. This is not the courthouse that stood during um, Ferrer's day. That one has since been destroyed. But before, while we're talking about courthouses, I will mention that there were treasure stories um, that surfaced about Ferrer in Lincolnton. Um, one of them uh, involves um, the Union Army, um, uh, at the very end of the Civil War, they were coming through Lincolnton, but the townspeople got a couple of days notice um, that it was going to happen. And many of the men moved their valuables to the vault of the old courthouse, which was on the same site. Um, and Ferrer at the time was in his 80s. He needed assistance. And so he asked one of his best friends, actually his best friend, um, a man named Wallace Reinhardt, to hire a wagon team because his valuables were heavy. They were in three wooden chests associated with seafaring men. So they, uh, the team of men loaded the chests into the wagon, took them the two blocks to the courthouse. And the story goes that once all of the chests were loaded and securely into the vault, 
that he asked Wallace Reinhardt to stay after, opened one of the chests, and it was full of gold coins. And he scooped some out and handed them to Wallace Reinhardt and said, I really appreciate your help today. Um, and so uh, stories like that um, during the time that he lived there um, were one of the reasons that the townspeople were um, very, very convinced he wasn't quite, none of this was quite adding was. up, right? Uh, you can move to the next slide. The um, what you're going to see here is the very first document that places him in Lincoln County. And this was in 1839, Hedick's tax list. Um, we also want to note that the Lorenzo Ferrer in Mississippi, and even once we got to the Lorenzo Ferrer in Lincolnton, there was no other Lorenzo Ferrer alive in America. And we were able to prove actually with research at Historic New Orleans um, Research Center, the Williams Research Center, um, that he did not come in through the ports either. Uh, um, this There was only one fella using this name uh, and we can document him mm -hmm. absolutely everywhere he goes and know for sure that he's not a different guy. Um, next slide is um, a uh, the document that um, we unearthed that proved uh, that he was a founding member of Lincoln Lodge, the Freemason Lodge, 137 in Lincolnton. The, the book talks about um, this document uh, and the number of ways that he lied on it. Um, so if you get the book, it's a really interesting, this document is really, really fascinating. So I won't, I won't spoil all those secrets. I'll let you get the book and uh, determine that for yourself. Um, next slide. This is actually the tabletop monument that you see there is the um, the grave of Lorenzo Ferrer. He's buried at St. Luke's um, Episcopal Church in Lincolnton. The grave to the right of his um, with a rounded arch at the top, that is Louisa's monument. Um, she died at the age of 40, um, very tragically and very much earlier than him. Um, but they are buried side by side in the, the graveyard. If you're ever in North Carolina, it's uh, worth a stop to come and see. Next slide. The building that you see here is called Pleasant Retreat Academy, um, and this is the building where the Freemason Lodge met um, when Lorenzo Ferrer was part of that lodge. They um, met on the second floor, um, and this leads us to the most exciting part of our, um, our research. Uh, the next slide. Um, we um, discovered that Ferrer was a founding member by getting a tip from a current member of that lodge who said, hey, nobody in town really knows it, but Lorenzo Ferrer was one of ours. Um, and we somehow, I'm still not quite sure, <laughs> talked our way into the Freemason Lodge and they let us look at their records. Um, and uh, we ended up, we had to be voted in and it we had did. to be a unanimous vote. If even one brother did not want us there, we couldn't be. But they allowed us to look at their historic ledger book. And we learned so much about Lincoln County history. It blew our minds. And we had to make the promise that we would only publish and publicly talk about what we discovered related yeah. to Ferrer because there were an awful lot of uh, it's an awful lot of dirty laundry aired out about very many prominent families from the beginning of Lincolnton to now that uh, we we know, but we can't tell. Mm -hmm. We're going to uh, they were the, the Freemasons were so good to us. There's no way we'd ever break that trust. But it was a few weeks after we finished the manuscript historic. Uh, I'm sorry, um, the uh, publisher, um, University of Louisiana Press, they were anxious for us to get the book to, to publication because we were scared we were going to get scooped. Um, we'd been working for so long. Um, uh, we ended up having to stop posting where we were going on Facebook for mm -hmm. research because we um, we had a couple of folks who were kind of following and we um, we didn't want to give up our locations. But we were really scared somebody was going to publish an article right. scooping us before we could get the book out. So. Um, it was a few weeks after we finished, the, the manuscript was getting ready to go to press, and we got a call from the Freemason Lodge, and they said, sort of with a mysterious voice, we found something, we need you to get up here. So we rush up, and what they have laid out on the table is the sword that you see in front of you, and uh, we needed a little bit of an education uh, on what this meant and what it was. Um, this was Lincoln Lodge 137's Tyler Sword. A Tyler is a position in every Freemason Lodge that um, is 
appointed by the master to guard the door um, and monitor the entrance of every person during ceremonies. And so the tiler stands there with a sword. Every Freemason Lodge in America has one of these two. We believe it's a metaphor for guarding the secrets. We don't think the tiler actually like wax people or anything. Um, But this is the one, the sword that they had used. And they said, we think this is really old. We talked to our oldest member who said it's been hanging on that rusty nail as long as I've been here. Um, And so we used the markings to determine um, that this was a um, War of 1812 cavalry saber manufactured in 1812 or 1813 by a man named Nathan Starr, who was contracted by the United States government to make 5,000 swords for the government to use in the, the War of 1812. This sword is in the second run. Um, The first batch of swords Star made had leather scabbards, and this one has iron. So we know it's the second batch. And we did some investigating and determined that of the founding members of that lodge, none of them had War of 1812 connections, but for Lorenzo Ferrer, who was really Jean Lafitte living in Lincolnton. And so we were very excited to find this period sword there with no other reason for it being there than Lorenzo Ferrer donated it. Um, I could not sleep that night because I may or may not have held a pirate sword and determined that we, in the day that we had had with it, had not really looked at the scabbard very closely. We had really been focused on the sword. And so we called them and begged one more time, pretty please let us come back to the lodge and um, look at that scabbard more closely. We uh, took a black light with us this time turned the lights out and uh, one of the the youngest brother in the lodge, a a man named um, Lyndon Berry, he sort of had his his young eyes down closest to the scabbard as we began to look. And all at the same time, we saw an inscription, hand etched, not professional, um, and it had letters. And uh, we said, all right, Lyndon, you're closest. Tell us what you see. And Um, We need to note that Lyndon had not done the research that we had done. Lyndon had uh, no idea of what he Mm -hmm. should have been looking for. But we said, tell us what you see. And he said, I see a capital J. I see a lowercase n. And then I see a space. Then I see a capital L. And that's when we (laughs) nearly passed out. (laughs) Because we knew what the remaining letters were going to say. A, F, F, I, T, E, just as Jean Lafitte always signed his name to documents, never J-E-A-N, he always abbreviated, and he spelled his last name with two Fs um, and one T. Jean Lafitte's hand-etched signature was on the scabbard of the sword that had been hanging for all of this time in the Freemason Lodge in Lincolnton, North Carolina, and they had absolutely no idea. There's a reason they didn't know. We knew that we could not publish this finding without there being immediate skepticism about us planting the sword or faking the inscription. So we set out, and this took a little bit of time Mm -hmm. to secure, but we got assistance from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Colonial Williamsburg, um, and the Smithsonian. This is like, I can't forget the Smithsonian. (laughs) Um, They helped us find the a most appropriate expert to give us answers. Um, And that turned out to be an antique armor and metals specialist who um, gave us some very good information. So we had to travel with the sword to get this this expert's assistance. The Freemason Lodge had to send an escort. The sword cannot leave the building without a chaperone. And so um, Brent Turner, you can move to the next slide. I think that might be him. Um, or about the Actually, the next, yeah, that's the inscription. Yeah, so that's the inscription. You can sort of see where it is on the um, on the sword, uh, but you can move to the next slide. Uh, Brent traveled with us, Brent Turner. Um, that was the day we went and had the sword verified, um, but that expert gave us some really good information. The reason that we could not, uh, that they did not know they had a, an inscription on that sword is because it was hard to see with the naked eye. Mm-hmm. Somebody had put a very heavy coat of oil or varnish on that sword around the time that it was produced. 
um, that varnish had sunk down in the, the hand etched signature and made it very difficult to see. The expert was able to say under microscope, I can see the exact letters that you see, it's spelled just the same. That intentional inscription is different under the microscope than the surface nicks and dings that are all over the sword from use. Um, he said, I can, I can tell that this is an intentional inscription. And he said, I will verify for you that this oil is very old and it is over the top of the signature. So he said, I say that the signature um, and the oil are actually of the age of the sword itself, um, uh, very early 1800s, right, is around the time that it was produced. Um, and so this provided with us um, the reasoning. There's no other reason this would be there other than Lorenzo Ferrer being Jean Lafitte. Um, as well, after reading the minutes of this lodge, they document every donation they receive but this sword is not there. Mm -hmm. And we talked to the members there who said it has to be because a founding member donated it before they were an official lodge taking minutes. Um, and so that, I mean, it just lines everything up um, just about as perfectly um, as, it, as it possibly could. Um, we're gonna skip here because we do wanna give you some time to ask us questions. If you wanna advance slides, we may skip through a few. This is a ballad um, that was found in Ferrer's house whenever he died uh, in 1875. Um, it is part of um, ongoing research, mm -hmm. uh, which is very exciting. Um, this is a copy of his will, um, also a very interesting document um, that there's a whole chapter devoted to in the book, which you can read for yourself. Mm -hmm. There's some tricky business happening with this will. Um, uh, and we're, uh, we're excited to, to continue to research that. Um, next slide, I think we, you can skip one more. Let's talk a little bit about our new developments. Do you want to uh, mention the uh, society? I will. Um, uh, several months ago, we decided to form the Jolifi Historical Society. And the main reason being we, uh, during our own research, could really have used, even though there were, including your own, wonderful archival repositories, um, we certainly could have used sort of a one-stop shop of Lafitte studies and uh, ended up, as Ashley said earlier, traveling from as far west as Austin, Texas, all the way up to Princeton in order to try and pull all these pieces together. Um, so it occurred to us that uh, future research might be better advanced if there was sort of a central clearinghouse. And we are by no means um, official, professional historians. We are at best arm, uh, armchair researchers, but, but we're um, fun ones. We are. We're, <laughs> we're with it. Uh, give us that. Um, so that is why we decided to form this group. And we've been meeting quarterly um, and we have members from all over the United States um, who attend via Zoom. And we also have in-person meetings. And mm -hmm. Right away after the first meeting, because what we wanted to do was <clears throat> encourage new research and new discovery, one of our members actually ended up making a very pivotal discovery. I and that's the next slide. You want to that, move to the next yeah, slide? Yeah, if you want to move to the next slide, um, we, I will, I'll let you tell okay. this. What you did. So, um, th this new development, um, when Ferrer lived in Lincolnton with Louisa, they were um, um, romantically involved. Now, um, in, uh, in the, the year that they were living in and the fact that she was his slave, that, that word romantically just doesn't, it's, the, it's inappropriate, it doesn't work. Um, they were um, sexually involved, I think is a better way to put that. Um, whether that was by her choice or whether that was forced upon her, we don't know. Um, but there was a child um, that the people in town said was um, their son. His name was Vitinius Ferrer. And there are only two documents, um, lots of stories that we can't prove, mm -hmm. um, but lots of stories that indicate that um, uh, he was their son. Um, the, the two documents we have, one is at the church, St. Luke's Episcopal, where they are both buried, um, that lists Vitinius as a slave of Lorenzo Ferrer. 
Um, and the will in which uh, Vitinius was left $100 by Ferrer, the only two documents we have. He left town shortly after Ferrer died and never came back. And nobody had ever been able to figure out where one of the members of our newly formed uh, Lafitte Society within 24 hours of our first meeting found where he went. Just like his father, he changed his name uh, to Augustus Ferrier and um, ended up um, uh, moving to Boston. And so this is his death certificate. Um, and um, uh, we are um, continuing to follow leads in Boston because we have a body in Lincolnton and Augustus, now. the descendant, is buried there, some possible descendant. We are feeling really, really good about this being the, the exact location of where he went. Um, and so we are continuing um, to follow those leads. Um, uh, and I saw someone had asked the question, did you consult the, um, the Journal of Jean Lafitte? Um, and uh, we did. Um, and, and did you, uh, I think, I'll, I'll have to go back to that question. Um, are, are you talking about the Journal of Jean Lafitte that uh, was produced in the middle part of the last century? Um, if you are, we can sort of address that in the questions because there's a whole lot um, uh, that's tied up with that. Uh, next slide. You want to take that one? Well, um, this has just recently surfaced in the diary of a very prominent man in Lincoln County, um, Judge David Schink, who wrote, he kept a very detailed journal from the time he was about 15 years old until his death. And it reads like a day in and day out chronicle of life here in Lincolnton during the time that Ferrer lived here. And this was discovered um, in the diary of David Schink. And of course, you can read what it says on the screen. Uh, there was an infidel and they did not use that term lightly in that day. Um, there was a very strong um, connotation mm -hmm. to um, witchcraft and sorcery um, when someone was called an infidel. So um, there was an infidel out by the name of Farrier, a Frenchman, but he is very respectable and intimate with Mr. Lander, who preached, and it was that that brought him out. This was the second. We also have an anecdotal reference to um, Ferrer being associated uh, at, and being called an, an infidel. infidel. That happened about 10 or 15 years after this. So um, we are actively investigating to see if we can find more um, because the connection to witchcraft and of course voodoo and all of that um, might be very, very significant um, to the earlier life of Lafitte. Yep. And next slide, and this may be our last one, I think, and then we'll be ready for, um, uh, for questions. We are also um, examining new Masonic connections, both domestic and international that are emerging. Um, so what you're going to see in the, the book that we've just published is um, the recognition that there is this really large circle um, of, of Masonic workings that Lafitte and every single man he was associated with, yeah. are, they're all involved in this. And these plots, while our book focused on um, the, the, uh, the life of Lafitte and how he moved from place to place and, and got there successfully and kept himself out of jail. <laughs> um, the, the next project that we're working on is really revealing how the Masonic connections, when you step back and look at this at a more macro level, um, there were much bigger workings that were going on. Mm -hmm. And we're beginning to find indications that Lafitte had his hands in these things. Um, and uh, we're talking about um, sort of like empire building kinds of, of schemes. And so um, that, that's one of the, the newest parts of the research that um, is, is ongoing. Like even this week, we're still mm -hmm. actively pushing. Um, and then check for me, uh, last slide, I believe. Um, yes, there's one more new development. Um, our book sort of posits that Edward Livingston was sort of the tip top person as far as power who may have been assisting um, Lafitte. Um, but we are beginning to see indications <clears throat> that there may have been other very prominent historical figures who were um, uh, involved in his yeah. flight from place to place. 
um, and then involved in his ability to move his money and hide it right. um, and uh, keep it all from being confiscated by um, by governments and uh, such. And so um, that's sort of what we're we're plugging away at. But at this point, uh, we'd be delighted to take any questions that you have. And we can't see the chat, so we're going to need uh, someone to read those and, and ask. Absolutely. Well, thank y'all so much. That was wonderful. Um, I really appreciate that. And I see we're already getting some questions <clears throat> here. Uh, so without further ado, I'll kind of jump into it. Well, do we want to start by um, talking about Suzanne's question? Did you research the Journal of Jean Lafitte? I did. Okay. Yes. Um, so let me, I'll talk to that for just <clears throat> a moment. And thank you for the question, Suzanne. Um, so in the middle part of the last century, a document um, called the Journal of Jean Lafitte emerged. It is housed in Liberty, Texas uh, at the Sam Houston Regional Library. We went and looked at it um, uh, to determine its validity. Um, about half of Lafitte scholars say it is legitimate. The other half say it is a complete farce. We can't even talk about it and kind of keep a straight face. <laughs> um, it's not legitimate. Um, in fact, um, we uh, wrote a whole chapter in our book uh, disproving its um, uh, disproving its validity. Um, and there were a couple of reasons for that. So the, the people in the Lafitte community who do not agree with its um, validity have pointed out that the man who produced it was a con artist. He changed his name to Lafitte about five minutes before he said, hey, world, look, I'm a descendant of Jean Lafitte and I have his journal. He was also had been um, caught forging other historical documents, including one related to the Alamo. And he was a dealer in old papers and an expert in old inks. <laughs> and so there were about 10 different red flags that were waving around this fellow not being um, legitimate. But we wanted to look at the actual text. And that's one of the things being an English professor, I was able to bring that expertise to a reading of the, um, uh, the journal that had never been conducted before. Um, I, I use rhetorical analysis. Here's my, my teacher moment here. Writer, reader, text, right? Uh, when we're looking at a text, we have to consider who wrote it, what were the reasons, um, and does what that person wrote make sense with who you know that person was? And so um, there are about a thousand different ways that the rhetorical triangle doesn't square with this document. But one example of those, um, the writer of the journal in writing about, and he's claiming he's Jean Lafitte, um, in writing about his younger life, this would have been happening in the, seven, the early 1780s, claimed that his parents sent him to a, um, a uh, Caribbean island to study uh, under um, a schoolmaster there and that they got word on another Caribbean island that there was gonna be a course in psychology that they were gonna take and their parents sent them from that Caribbean island to another to take the course in psychology. The problem is at that point in the 1780s, psychology didn't exist. <laughs> um, and so he was referencing a word that didn't, ha it hadn't happened yet and there weren't, it wasn't even a science among scientists yet. So why would a child from a middle-class family be sent to a, a, a Caribbean island to study something that didn't exist? And so um, it, the, the journal is not legitimate. And because of that, the theory that Lafitte went to, to Illinois, St. Louis and then Illinois, that's posited in that journal are, um, they do not work. And that opens the door for the Lafitte for rare connection to, to mm -hmm. actually be legitimate. That's fascinating. I feel like that could be its own presentation. All the yeah, time. <laughs> there's a chapter in the book. So okay. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good read, I think. Perfect. Perfect. All right. We've got some other questions here. So Kim, uh, hi, Kim, is asking, uh, so there's no link to John Larkin and living in St. Louis? No. Okay. Is that Just, kind no. of, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good answer. Yeah. And so the, the interesting thing about that, though, is that um, it was such a manufactured story that if it was true, there would be a body of stories in St. Louis surrounding, surrounding it. And there's not. 
it's just like it, it was manufactured in a vacuum. And so there's no corroborating evidence around any of it. Um, and there are no documents to prove any of it is true as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. Absolutely. Um, Carol is asking, um, the use of Maison Rouge to refer to Lafitte in code got me thinking about the name he took as Lorenzo Ferrer, which could be loosely translated as crazy boatman or ferryman. Are, it, are there other aliases Lafitte used? You talk about those. He did. He used um, many different mm -hmm. aliases, and even one of them was a number, <laughs> 13. It's number um, 13. But uh, some of his other aliases, uh, one of the funniest ones, and I still, I, I try to get into his head on this one, Wesley Clinton McOr. <laughs> if you're going to make up an alias, why in the world would you pull that one out of thin air? But he did. Um, Captain Hilaire was another um another alias that he used. The book goes into several of those. I think I'm not sure which chapter, but um, that was sort of commonplace for a lot of men in that day. Um, for whatever reason, if they felt like they needed to be someone else um, undercover, they would take a different name. Yeah. And so that is what Lafitte, uh, that was one of the characteristics of his life. We do believe, though, that he chose Lorenzo Ferrer for yes. a reason. Um, uh, one of the other meanings of Ferrer, it's an occupational surname for a blacksmith. We think maybe he chose Ferrer uh, to make a uh, sort of a, a, a nod and a wink back to his New Orleans days uh, on Bourbon Street with the blacksmith shop. Um, so we think maybe choosing Ferrer could have been an inside joke. Um, as well, um, Lorenzo Ferrer Maldonado was an explorer who uh, discovered the Northwest Passage um, and obviously very famous. And so we think maybe he kind of combined some things there to come up with uh, with a new alias. Um, that's fascinating. And um, so we have another question. As long as we're talking about aliases, um, somebody is asking, did he ever use the name Francis Houdet? Did y'all come across that alias? While you were doing that one, um, there's a whole list in the book. That one's not ringing a bell. Um, but I, I honestly, we think that the ones that we know of are probably a fraction of the true yeah. number of the ones that there were. And truly, no one is even totally sure that Jean Lafitte was his real name. Yeah. There is the possibility he was born someone else and took the name Lafitte in early adulthood. Yeah. And we think that possibility is very strong because we don't have birth records um, and we're reasonably sure he came from France um, or was in uh, just across the border in Spain. Um, and in those days, both the Spanish and the French kept really good records. There is no record of a Jean Lafitte with the family he was supposed to have uh, being born. Um, so we like the, the, the idea that he was not born a Lafitte. Um, and that's the reason we can't discover his birth records. And oddly enough, Lorenzo Ferrer was a Frenchman with technically a Spanish name. Mm -hmm. So maybe somebody who was from that region. Yes. Yeah. What? It, uh, that's a great question though. When, uh, as far as y'all know, what's the first time we see Jean Lafitte in the historical record that we say his name show up? 1805. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. a document from Grand Terre um, in 1805. Um, and I believe that may have been a historic, New is the original, the original, I think the original maybe with historic New Orleans. It's not in, it's not at, uh, in Austin. No, I think we found it at HNOC. I think the original, you guys might have the original. Oh, wow. That well, one. Walk on down the street and check it yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> and actually we did have somebody in the audience. Um, who asked uh, what you found at our research center that was um, useful to y'all in the book. So we have one example right there, which is that document, but is there anything else that you found? The court yeah. records, I court. have a distinct memory of spending a lot of hours going through the court records, mm -hmm. uh, looking, searching in vain for uh, Lorenzo Ferrer um, to come through and never found him. Yeah, there are a couple of documents as well. We did a handwriting chapter um, because we do have some things that Lorenzo Ferrer hand wrote 
that we can compare to um, things we know Jean Lafitte wrote. And we know that handwriting science might be a little bit shaky. Um, for every expert that you have evaluate something, you can find another expert who will say, no, that's not true. But as sort of lay women here uh, <laughs> in, in looking at Jean Lafitte's art, uh, uh, handwriting and in looking at Lorenzo Ferrer's, there are really obvious connections, um, including with how he did his capital L's. And um, it, uh, we did look at several documents at the Williams Research Center um, and uh, several of the archivists there because they knew what we were doing were really nice to get permission to bring the originals out um, so that we could view those and not a scan. Um, mm -hmm. And um, looking at those documents helped us with handwriting analysis as well. Um, as well, there were several several books in the collection there. Uh, we spent many days there. Several books in the collection provided um, outstanding um, cultural and historical reference points that we needed. Um, and uh, we really cannot say enough good things um, about the staff there. Um, and uh, those of you who are in New Orleans, you have to go. If, if for nothing else, just to wander around. It's, it's a magnificent collection. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I think we have a couple of our uh, colleagues from the research center here tonight, so I'm sure they're oh. delighted to hear. Hello, to hear that. <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I have a question here touching upon uh, Pierre, and mm -hmm. I was uh, somebody's asking, uh, "Was his brother named Pierre?" And I wonder if y'all could talk about any connections. I know I think maybe that's a tenuous connection as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. Um, that's a, sort of a gray area. There are some historians who do believe firmly that Pierre and Lafitte were brothers. And then there are others who say, nope, they were both aliases. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't know if that was just a merger of convenience. These two men found each other and decided to um, pose as brothers. Uh, we aren't sure. Yeah, there's no documented evidence. So the people who are really, really sure don't have any documents to back it up. So um, it's reasonable to assume that they were, but there's no proof that, of that. I have, I have actually my own question here that I'd like to ask. So you show that portrait in the beginning of John Lafitte, and it's kind of that classic, you know, it's the profile of him wearing mm -hmm. the hat and he's got the curly hair and we've all kind of seen it before. Um, and you said that you're not actually sure that that is actually a portrait right. of him. And I was kind of wondering if y'all had any idea of why this became associated with him. Like, do you know when we start seeing this image and, you know, maybe where it came from? You can answer, I'll answer that. that. Yeah. yeah. So our book in the beginning lists all of the portraits um, and where the, the originals are housed. Um, and there's, you know, five or six of them that are floating around. There's only one, and it was a sketch that may have been done from life, but there's even no proof of that. Um, and so um, a, a lot of the portraiture really um, sort of came to prominence in the 19, uh, the middle part of the last century, like the 1950s, when there were a lot of pirate movies um, and um, uh, there were, were authors using these on book covers and um, there was the Buccaneer movie and um, all of these sort of pop culture things began to um, emerge. And that's really when those sketches began to be, I would suggest, overused and, um, and, and, and put out in, for public consumption as if they were legitimate. Um, there uh, is a portrait at the Rosenberg in, um, uh, in, in, in um, yes, um, there's also a portrait uh, at uh, the Louisiana State Museum, um, but the um, historians there have proven without a shadow of a doubt that it was not contemporary. In fact, I think he's wearing the wrong clothes for the period that he uh, that he lived. And so um, we don't have uh, an accurate portrait that we can verify as well because Ferrer lived to 1875. We were so hopeful for photography. Yes. Um, that maybe somebody took a picture of him in Lincolnton and it didn't happen. Um, interestingly, though, if Vitinius slash Augustus Ferrier turns out to be his son, he didn't die until 1913. And there's a chance we're going to find some portraits uh, or photographs, hopefully, in Boston somehow um, that, that would connect them because the stories about 
Vitinius and Ferrer in Lincolnton suggest that they were identical, um, that they looked just alike. And so we may get an indication of what Ferrer looked like if we can see a portrait of um, Vitinius. Vitinius. That's really exciting. I hope um, I hope y'all are able to find a picture of him. Yeah. Um, that leads me to another question I'm seeing here. Do you believe that uh, Lorenzo Ferrer has any living descendants? We don't, we don't, mm -hmm. at this point, we've not, we don't think that Augustus in Boston had any children um, uh, and we have not been able to verify that, um, that he was married. So we don't think now, let us back up in every town where we go uh, to give a presentation, there are people who come forward and say, have you heard the story of so-and-so I'm supposed to be descended from such and such. There is a distinct possibility that, that Lorenzo Ferrer, that uh, Lafitte um, bore many children and had many wives and just sort of moved on to the next place and had another one. So we are not suggesting that there aren't living descendants. We've just not been able to verify that any of those stories are true. We think it's highly possible, um, uh, but we would have to sort of get down to DNA. Um, and that brings up a, a difficult question for us because where um, Lafitte is buried in Lincolnton is a very historic property. Um, and I think the idea of, of exhuming a body would be very traumatic there. Um, and we don't want to do anything because they've been very kind to us in our research. Um, we don't want to do anything that would bring negative attention or potentially destructive um, processes to their to their graveyard. And so um, the whole idea of DNA connection is very complicated. Well, I, I can definitely understand that as, you know, as being a historic site, absolutely. And so I, you know, I wish you luck as you're trying to kind of navigate and continue to make these connections. And I'm seeing here that we are just about out of time. Oh no. Um, I know, I know, I know it's gone by um, so quickly. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask one last question, which is if people want to uh, follow along to keep up with what you're doing, what would be the best way for them to keep up with y'all? Yeah, so they can follow us on Facebook, Jean Lafitte Revealed. It's a very active page. I am also going to, uh, in the chat here, type our email address. If anybody has a question for us that did not get answered, um, they can send that to us and we will be delighted. Um, to make sure I spelled everything correctly. Oh, I didn't. Got a proofread. <laughs> Gmail.com. It's got it. Perfect. There you go. So any further questions can be asked there. That's great because I know there are a lot of questions that we weren't able to ask tonight because we are just running out of time and there's some really great questions. So please reach out as John Lafitte Revealed at gmail.com mm -hmm. to answer your, ask your questions. Um, and Ashley and Beth, thank y'all so much for being here tonight with us. This has been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Please keep an eye out too. Um, there is a chance that our um, our project may come to a small screen or a big screen near you soon. We're, um, we have a production deal um, uh, that's in the works. And so um, we're hopeful that um, bigger things are to come. Wonderful. Okay, well, we will keep up with that. And yeah, best of luck in your continued research. And we can't Thank wait you. to hear what you discover next. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.